Hey guys, welcome to the last episode of Short Bits by Shorty for the P2 year. Holla! Can I get another holla? Holla! Um, sorry about drawing structures in the last video. Apparently I missed the memo of not having to know the structures for the last exam. TBH, I was probably late to class and missed that memo. What's new? Filipino time. Anyways, let's get started. Oh wait, to summarize the first 12-ish slides, the structure, you probably will not have to know this for the exam, but just to give you a basic foundation for the lecture, viruses are composed of sometimes an envelope plus surface antigens, the capsid, which is protecting the nucleic acid, or the encoding part of the virus. Key idea of the last uh, first few slides, viruses depend on the host for the biochemistry and for energy sources to replicate themselves. So they can't replicate on their own, they have to depend on the host for replication. Uh, viruses have a high mutation rate, which leads to vaccines becoming, or making vaccines difficult or impossible. And the viruses, rep depending on the host to replicate themselves, determines the difficulty of chemotherapy because um, viruses can transplant their genome into hosts, so you have to figure out which um, t cells are host cells, which are virus cells, or which are mixed cells. And you only want to target virus cells. So chemotherapy is hard because you only want to target virus cells and not just not human cells, because that can lead to increased toxicity in the patients. Okay, so we're going to go over five different classes of drugs, or five ways that antivirals work. The first way is by inhibiting virus capsid encoding, or by inhibiting the M2 ion channel. These drugs include amantadine or mantadine, and they work by two ways, or two models. One is that they directly block the channel. So in model one, they directly block the channel, the proton ion channel is shown here. So this is the proton ion channel in green. If you're colorblind, it's the one I'm circling right here. And the drug is in red, or the one I'm circling right here if you're colorblind. So, a model one is that the drug directly blocks the channel so that um, RNA can't leave, viral RNA can't leave. See, the drug is blocking RNA, viral RNA, so that it can't leave. Uh, model number two, the drug binds to the channel. So here's the drug binding to the channel. And this causes the channel to close, or in scientific terms, induces channel blocking. So you go from there to a closed channel. And the viral RNA can't leave. So as you can see here, the channel the drug binds to the channel, the channel closes, shown here, and the viral RNA can't leave. Um, so summarizing this, um, there are two ways that the drugs work. They either directly block the channel or they induce the channel to become blocked. And this causes step two, the, um, viral RNA can't penetrate to the host cell and since they can't penetrate to the host cell, they have no reason. The viral, the virus has no reason to uncoat. So this basically, amantadine, amantadine, remantadine prevent the uncoating and the pen, uh, uncoating of viral RNA and the penetration of viral RNA into the host cell. Um, if you're unsure about what uncoating is, refer to the handout, the first page of the handout where I show the structure of the virus and it has a coat or a capsid and an envelope. Um, so just to summarize again, the, um, the drug directly blocks or induces the blocking of a channel, the proton or the H2 or the H plus ion channel, and this inhibits the penetration of RNA, viral RNA into the host cell. And if the virus can't penetrate through the channel, it can't go through the channel to penetrate into the host cell, then it has no reason to release the capsid or the envelope of the virus and you stop viral replication. Um, the way that resistance is born is 
of, of course, mutation in, in the M2 ion channel. If you mutate the M2 ion channel protein, you can't get the drug to bind and you can't inhibit viral replication. Okay, so the next class of drugs are the DNA polymerase inhibitors. Um, just a review of basic biochemistry in case you forgot. This probably won't be an exam, but just so you understand how the drugs work in case I, when I talk about them later. Um, so nucleosides lack a phosphate group. So nucleosides lack a phosphate group and then converted to nucleotides with a phosphate group by a kinase. So kinases add phosphate groups um, f to nucleosides to convert them to nucleotides. Now nucleotides are extended into DNA by DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase puts nucleotides together which have phosphates together to put DNA. And why are these phosphates important to make DNA? Um, so here's a basic chemical reaction that happens. So here's your nucleo... Is this one nucleoside or nucleotide? Nucleoside because it lacks a phosphate. And is this one a nucleotide or a nucleoside? This one's a nucleotide because it has a phosphate. So nucleosides add to nucleotides at the 3 prime... Hmm. 3... Hmm. Three prime hydroxyl, and the f five prime phosphate. So nucleotides at the three prime hydroxyl add to the five prime phosphate of the nucleotide to link together. So you see one now increasingly sized strand from one separate nucleoside without a phosphate and one nucleotide with a phosphate. So the three prime hydroxyl of the nucleoside adds to the five prime end of the nucleotide to form one single strand. Um, and, and you release two phosphates. That's the reaction. And I'll show you why this is important later when we discuss the drugs. Ooh, I forgot to talk about this. Okay, so in his slides, he mentions two mechanisms of actions that DNA polymerase inhibitors work, which I'll show in the... when we talk about the drugs. Number one, they cap the end of the growing DNA chain, so they lead to chain termination, or they stop DNA, the DNA chain from growing, hence the term chain termination. Or number two, they bind to and inhibit DNA polymerase. So, so one, they either cap the DNA chain to stop the chain from growing, or they bind to inhibit DNA polymerase. And DNA polymerase inhibitors are selective for viruses over DNA, human DNA polymerase. Okay, so one class of DNA polymerase inhibitors are your nucleoside DNA, poly DNA polymerase inhibitors. Um, one group of drugs including there are two dr drugs there are two groups of drugs including the, included in this. There's acyclovir, oh crap, nacyclovir and the acyclovir analogs, and then there are the DNA nucleoside analogs, including guanosine, cytosine, adenosine, and thymidine analogs. Remember that your nucleosides are named guanosine, cytosine, adenosine, and thymidine analogs. I'll write that down for you. Um, nucleoside. So, acyclovir works by two ways. It chain terminates and it binds to DNA polymerase more tightly than its um, similar nucleoside, deoxyguanosine. So, what this means in English? So remember that earlier, earlier I said that you need your three prime hydroxyl in order to extend the chain because it adds the five prime phosphate. Well, acyclovir, acyclovir lacks the three prime hydroxyl, 
therefore it can't add to the 5' phosphate in the DNA backbone, so it chain terminates. So it stops the chain because you can't add to the 5' phosphate to extend the DNA chain, and therefore you lead to chain termination, which is bullet number one. Acyclovera lacks a 3' hydroxyl, thus leading to chain, chain termination. Um, number two, acyclovir, actually the base in acyclovir, right here, the base, looks like the one in guanosine. So, since it looks like guanosine, DNA polymerase might recognize acyclovir as guanosine, since it recognizes, things, recognizes the similar base, but, so it binds to DNA polymerase. However, acyclovir actually binds more tightly to DNA polymerase than deoxyguanosine. Um, therefore, it stops or inhibits right here DNA polymerase. So, um, so those are the two mechanisms by which acyclovir works. Now, the pathway by which acyclovir works is the following. So, remember, acyclovir is converted to the phosphate form, the triphosphate form, which is the actually the active form, by three kinases. Um, so, remember that in order to be active, acyclovir has to be phosphorylated, I highlighted it here, into the active form, the triphosphate form, by three kinases. Um, then this triphosphate form um, adds to DNA backbones by DNA polymerase, which actually chain terminates since it lacks the 3' hydroxyl. So, I show that in this little picture, I show both mechanisms, bullets 1 and 2. I show bullet 1 here because acyclovir actually lacks a 3' hydroxyl, and since it lacks a 3' hydroxyl, it chain terminates all the way at the bottom. It also, acyclovir also binds to DNA polymerase, thus inhibiting the enzyme. Um, hopefully that explains it. If not, let me know. <coughs> also remember that acyclovir looks like deoxyguanosine, that's why I put it in red. If you're colorblind, I'm circling it right now. Acyclovir looks like deoxyguanosine, that's why it binds to, binds to DNA polymerase. Remember that the phosphorylated form is active. Um, second group drugs, other than acyclovir and its analogs, are the nucleoside analogs. These work the same way as acyclovir and its acyclovir analogs. So the nucleoside analogs, the guanosine analogs, the cytosine analogs, the adenosine analogs, and the thymidine analogs, work the same way. They lead to chain termination, they lead to chain termination, and they bind more tightly to DNA polymerase than the respective analogs. So for example, ribavirin is a guanosine analog, so it binds more tightly to DNA than guanosine. Or cytarabine is a cytosine analog. I'm just reading out the slides. Um, so let's see, slide 22 if you want to look. Slide 22, cytarabine looks like cytosine, and it binds more tightly than to DNA polymerase than um, its analog, cy cytidine. Mm, cool. Um, yeah, so basically all you gotta remember for these, I hope, is that the nucleoside analogs, or guanosine analogs, cytidine analogs, adenosine analogs, and thymidine analogs, work the same way as acyclovir, steps bullets one and number two. Resistance to these drugs can develop because, number one, mutation in thymidine kinase. And you know that if you mutate the kinase, thymidine kinase, you can't convert acyclovir to the active form. And you can't do that, you can't lead to chain termination. Number two, mutation, oh crap, oh, mutation in viral DNA polymerase. So if you do, might mutate viral DNA polymerase, then acyclovir can't bind as well, and it can't inhibit the enzyme. So another class of drugs within the DNA polymerase inhibitors are the nucleotide um, DNA polymerase inhibitors. Remember that nucleotides already have a phosphate in them. Therefore, they do not need to, act to be activated by thymidine kinase like your nucleoside inhibitors, hmm, like acyclovir. Remember, acyclovir is a nucleoside, so it doesn't have a phosphate. 
and since it doesn't have a phosphate, it needs to be activated by the kinases. Rather, since nucleotides already have a phosphate, they do not need to act, be activated by thymidine kinase. Um, these are active against acyclovir-resistant viruses. Um, one important drug that he has us new is adefavir. So adefavir exists as a pro-drug. So adefavir exists as a pro-drug, and that looks like adenosine. Um, ooh, important. Remember that um, acyclovir looks like deoxyguanosine. Um, adefavir looks like adenosine. Ad looks like ad. Adenosine looks like adefavir. So adefavir is a prodrug that's broken down by host esterases. And important, not viral esterases, but host esterases to be converted into a defavir. So defavir is converted to the active form, the diphosphate form, by host adenylate kinase. Remember, adenylate kinase is a different enzyme than thymidine kinase. Remember that. Don't get confused. Um, so the diphosphate form is active. I put that in red. Um, so why, is, why, does it why does it exist as a prodrug? Because nucleotides or phosphates have poor bio bioavailability, so they can't get to the site of action as well. Um, resistance to these drugs can exist because, surprise, the DNA viral polymerase has mutations. If you mutate DNA viral polymerase, you lose binding of these drugs. So just to recap, nucleotide DNA polymerase inhibitors um, do not need to be activated by thymidine kinase because they're already phosphorylated, so thymidine kinase would be useless. Um, one example is adefavir. Adefavir is a project that's broken down by host esterases and is phosphorylated by host adenylate kinase to form the active diphosphate form. I remember, adefavir looks like adenosine. It exists as a prodrug in order to increase its bioavailability um, and resistance can be made by mutations in DNA viral polymerase. Okay, so just to go over the basics of re viral reverse trans... Okay, just kidding. Okay, uh, third group of drugs are your viral reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Um, yeah, so just to go over the basics now. So reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that converts single-stranded RNA of your viruses into pro-viral viral DNA. So the mechanism by which reverse viral reverse transcriptase inhibitors work is basically the same as your DNA polymerase inhibitors. So I'll compare the two after I, after I go over this. So for number one mechanism is it uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. I abbreviate them RT. So RT is reverse transcriptase inhibitor. I mean, reverse transcriptase. RT is reverse transcriptase. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so, RT inhibitors um, cap the end of the growing proviral DNA chain, um, similar to DNA polymerase inhibitors with a... Oh, forgot to write that. Um, lead to chain, chain termination. And hopefully, if you learn something for this video, you'll learn how chain termination happens. Um, if not, I'll go over it in my review part at the end. Uh, number two, they also bind to and inhibit reverse transcriptase. Um, they're selective for only viral reverse transcriptase over DNA polymer, over, yeah, humans, since humans don't really have reverse transcriptases. If you do, you're probably a virus. Um, anyway, so, to compare the two, so, remember that... Let's go back to square one. You also want to know the differences between two. Um, DNA polymerase inhibitors cap the end of a growing DNA chain, leading to chain termination, while reverse transcriptase inhibitors um, cap the end of a growing proviral DNA chain. Leading to chain termination. Um, DNA polymerase inhibitors 
bind to inhibit and inhibit DNA polymerase, whereas um, reverse transcriptase inhibitors bind to and inhibit reverse transcriptase. So know those differences. I think that's important. Um, and since these mechanisms of actions are pretty similar and the drugs look pretty similar, I'm not going to go over really how they work again. I'm just listing them. Um, if you want to learn how they work again, review how DNA polymerase inhibitors work. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go over the drugs now. Okay, so your nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Remember, nucleosides don't have a phosphate. So if it gives you a structure of, nucle of reverse transcriptase inhibitors and asks you to identify if they're nucleoside or nucleotides, remember nucleosides, nucleosides, let's highlight that. Nucleosides don't have a phosphate. Um, these are your deoxy blank analogs or deox deoxyguanosine, deoxythymidine, deoxyadenosine, and deoxycytidine analogs. And the reason I highlight that is because if you look at your DNA polymerase nucleoside analogs, so these are your I was talking about your DNA about your ooh, reverse transcriptase nucleoside analogs. So remember up here, this is, I was talking about your D nucleoside DNA polymerase inhibitors. Your DNA polymerase inhibitors do not have deoxy analogs. They only have your straight up base analogs, your guanosine, cytosine, cytidine. I actually wrote that wrong. It's supposed to be cytidine, but I'm too lazy to fix it. Adenosine and thymidine analogs. However, your nu reverse transcriptase inhibitors have your deoxy analogs, so deoxyguanosine, deoxythymidine, deoxyadenosine, and deoxycytidine. Um, yes, resistance can happen in these drugs um, by mutations and surprise viral reverse transcriptase. Now onto your nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Remember your nucleotide reverse tracing transcriptase inhibitors already have your phosphate, so that means they do not need to be activated by which enzyme? Thymidine kinase. So since they already have a phosphate, nucleotide reverse transcri transcriptase inhibitors don't need to be activated by um, thymidine kinase. So I'm gonna use, I'm gonna talk about this drug and then compare it to a defavir. So tenofovir is also a prodrug that's also cleaved to tenofovir by the host esterase. Remember, not the viral esterase, but your host esterase. Importante. <laughs> um, now your host, now tenofovir is converted to the active diphosphate compound by host adenylate that kinase. Remember, adenylate kinase is different from thymidine kinase. This drug also, along just like adenosine, looks like adenosine. Now to compare the two drugs. So remember, let's see. Okay. So right here, the adenosine pathway. So adenosine. Is also a prodrug that lo also looks like adenosine. Um, it's converted to a defavir by ooh surprise host esterase. A defavir is converted to the active ooh surprise diphosphate form by host adenylate kinase. Um, why does it exist as a prodrug again? Because phosphates have low, low bioavailability. Now back onto tenofovir again. Tenofovir is converted to tenofovir by host esterases, which is converted to the active diphosphate compound by host adenylate kinase. Um, remember that tenofovir also looks like adenosine. So, if you know one nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitor, you know the other one. Well, at least the pathways. Um, the way I remember this is... 
transcriptase inhibitor has a T in it, and so does tenofovir. Um, ooh, cool thing if you haven't noticed. Um, your, you can tell your nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors because they have pho, not your uh, Vietnamese noodles, but your pho. So the pho here, oh, man. Um, and then your pho over here. So pho is actually a little abbreviation for phosphate, if you haven't figured that out. Isn't that cool? It's cool how chemists name things. So pho over here refers to your phosphate that you already have. Cool, right? Um, easy way to remember it, that's, your, that's nucleotide, because that, that already has a pho in the name. If it already has a pho in the name, it already has a pho in the structure, hence a nucleotide. Not your Vietnamese noodles, which I actually had for dinner today. Okay, now your next class of drugs within your reverse transcriptase inhibitors are your non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. These bind at an allosteric site within the reverse transcriptase enzyme, not the active reverse transcriptase site. This induces a conformation change by binding to the allosteric site, and therefore the active site of reverse transcriptase becomes inactive, and the drug or um, your nucleosides can't bind anymore. So binding to the active site, the allosteric site, not the active site, induces a conformation change in the reverse transcriptase enzyme, and the active site of the reverse transcriptase enzyme can't um, sh sh um, convert single-stranded RNA to proviral DNA anymore. Resistance to these drugs um, can occur by, surprise, mutation in the reverse transcriptase, but at the allosteric site, not the active site. That's why I wrote that down. Okay, so our fourth and second to last class of drugs we're going to talk about are your protease inhibitors. So, the way these work. So here's the basic normal viral um, replication, site, replication process. So you start off with proviral DNA, which turns into RNA, then the precursor polyproteins, and your functional prote proteins. Now your proviral DNA has genes including GAG, Paul, and ENV for your envelope genes. So three important genes you gotta know. These are converted to, these are translated into an inactive protein, the precursor polyproteins. Now these inactive proteins are cleaved into smaller active proteins, so these are active, called integrase, reverse transcriptase, and protease, by the enzyme protease. So protease actually helps make, make more protease, functional protease enzymes from a larger inactive protein. So what protease inhibitors do is that they bind to prote or they inhibit protease. By inhibiting protease, you prevent the production of active HIV proteins. And if you prevent these proteins, then you prevent HIV from, from, mature, from maturing fully, and therefore you inhibit both HIV growth and HIV development, especially the prevention of new virus particles from prevent from maturing fully. Um, resistance to these drugs can develop by mutation in, surprise, the HIV protease. So remember, H protease inhibitors block uh, the enzyme protease from forming active functional HIV proteins. And if you prevent active proteins from forming, then you can, then HIV can't spread or function mature uh, fully. And these are formed from the gag pole and envelope genes. Okay, so Dr. Ellis spent quite a bit of time on these structures, so I'm gonna go to the basics of what he said, um, since he probably won't go in depth and examine like the specifics. Um, anyway, so here are two protease inhibitors. Um, what you wanna do, notice that they both have Importantly, a hydroxyl group. Why isn't my red showing? 
They both have the hydroxyl group. One over there, and then one over here. So long structures, these are long chains, find the hydroxyl group. Um, let's see. On either side of the hydroxyl group are your hydrophobic parts. So you have hydrophobic part, hydrophobic part, hydrophobic part. So, um, and on one side, I will go over this. I'm just trying to explain everything all at once. Um, and on one side, you have a group that looks like a glycine. You won't have to recognize this. I'm just telling you the important stuff he told us. One group looks like a glycine amino acid. The other side looks like a phenylalanine. Um, yeah, so I've identified the important parts of the structures for you. The greens are your hydrophobic sides, your reds are your hydroxyls, and your blue indicate which um, parts of the molecules looks like gly the amino acids, your glycine, your phenylalanine. So, what your reds do, um, your hydroxyls do, is that they form hydrogen bonds within the protease enzyme. Now what your greens do, your hydrophobic parts do, is that they form um, hydrophobic, hydrophobic binding interactions within the enzyme. Well, I can't spell in the protease enzyme. And they also anchor the hydroxyl into place. The red hydroxyl in place. Now what the blue does, the, am the amino acid looking stuff, is that they help recognize the drug in the protease active site. So to go over the structures again, if he gives you the structures, they're pretty long structures, unlike the other ones, they're pretty short structures. So these protease inhibitors are pretty long structures. Look for the hydroxyl, and on either side you have hydrophobic parts. And the amino acids that are that are important recognition are glycine and phenylalanine. Gly and phe, glycine and phenylalanine. So what the hydroxyl does, it forms hydrogen bonds in the protease to help bind it to the enzyme. Hydro the green parts, your hydrophobic the green parts, your hydrophobic parts help anchor the drug in the protease binding site and they also help anchor the hydroxyl into place so that it can form binding interactions. The blue parts, the amino acid looking parts, help the protease enzyme recognize the drug because the drug recognizes, I mean protease recognizes specific amino acid sequences and specifically it recognizes glycine phenylalanine. So if you have the drug look like phenylalanine and glycine, then you can help the drug bind or be identified by protease. Doesn't make sense, let me know. But overall, um, the hydroxyls and the hydrophobic parts help the drug bind into the protease enzyme. And the uh, amino acid looking parts, so um, the phenylalanine over here, looks like phenylalanine here. This actually looks like glycine over here. Glycine over here looks like glycine. Phenylalanine, that phenyl group over here, makes it look like phenylalanine. Um, helps the protease enzyme recognize the drug since it recognizes specific amino acid sequences, specifically glycine and phenylalanine. Okay, our last class of drugs are our neuraminidase inhibitors. 
These prevent the release of the virus from the host cell. So, basic um, neuraminidase pathway. So you have the virus, which is coated with a glycoprotein called hemagglutinin. And on the surface of hemagglutinin, you have um, N-acetylsialic acid. So I'm going to highlight that for you. N-acetylsialic acid is this part over here. N-acetylsialic acid. Say it with me. N-acetylsialic acid. One more time. N-acetylsialic acid. One more time for Dr. Ellis. N-acetylsialic acid. So on the surface of hemagglutinin, you have N-acetylsialic acid. Now what viral neuraminidase do, does is that it cleaves this part of the molecule to release your N-acetylsialic acid and separates N-acetylsialic acid. Hopefully if I say it enough, you'll get it stuck in your head. It releases N-acetylsialic acid and separates it from your virus, which has your glycoprotein, which is hemagglutinin. So this virus is fully mature and released, and it can go infect the host cells. So what neuraminidase inhibitors do, like zanamivir and oseltamivir, or Tamiflu, what they do is they prevent viral neuraminidase. So if you prevent viral neuraminidase, viral neuraminidase then you prevent N-acetylsialic acid from being released. Therefore, you prevent the virus from being released, and it can't infect the host cells. Oh, wow, that is it. Thank the Lord God Almighty. Okay, so now let's review everything, and then we'll be done with the semester. Okay, so basic virus structure, key idea. Viruses depend on the host to survive. Um, first category of drugs we went over are your capsid uncoating drugs, or your M2 ion channel inhibitors. Remember, these act by two pathway, by one directly blocking the M2 proton ch channel, or by inducing proton channel blocking. You block the channel, you block the vir you block RNA from being released, and you also block uncoating since it has no reason to uncoat since RNA can't be released. Resistance can be inferred by mutation in the M2 ion channel protein. Second class of drugs are your DNA polymerase inhibitors. Uh, remember, nucleosides don't have phosphates. Nucleotides have phosphates. Um, nucleoti nucleosides are converted to nucleotides by kinases. Remember that the 3' hydroxyl adds to the 5' phosphate in order to extend the DNA backbone. The DNA polymerase inhibitors work by 1. Capping the end of the growing DNA chain or chain termination by lacking a 3' hydroxyl. Number two, they also bind, these drugs also bind to an inhibited DNA polymerase, and they're selective for viral DNA polymerase over human DNA polymerase. Nucleoside DNA polymerase don't have your phosphate, as the nucleosides. The phosphorylated form is the active form, and they both lead to chain termination and inhibition of DNA polymerase. Remember that acyclovir looks like deoxyguanosine. Um... Your nucleoside analogs do not have deoxy in front of them, like your nucleoside tra reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Your DNA polymerase inhibitors, your nucleoside versions, have only guanosine, cytosine, adenosine, and thymidine analogs. They work the same way as acyclovir. They lead to chain termination and inhib inhibition of DNA polymerase. Re 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 resistance by mutation in thymidine kinase and mutation of viral DNA polymerase. Therefore, the drugs can't bind anymore. Nucleotide DNA polymerase inhibitors do not need to be activated by thymidine kinase like your nucleoside DNA polymerase inhibitors. Um, Adefavir is one example. It's a prodrug that looks like adenosine that's converted to adefavir by host esterases. And then your active diphosphate formed by adenylate kinase, the host version. Exists as a prodrug since phosphates have low bioavailability. Resistance can be inferred by viral DNA polymerase mutations. Now your reverse transcriptase inhibitors work basically the same way as your DNA polymerase inhibitors, except 
they cap the growing p proviral DNA chain and they bind to inhibit reverse transcriptase, not DNA polymerase. They are selective for only viral reverse transcriptase. Um, to remember your nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors don't have your phosphates. Resistance can be conferred by mutations in viral reverse transcriptase. Remember your analogs have deoxy in them. So your analogs have deoxy in front of them. They work the same way. Um, nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors um, have phosphates in them. Tenofovir basically works the same way as a defovir. You have your host esterase and your host adenylate kinase. Your diphosphate forms your active compound. It looks like adenosine. Um, Tenofovir starts with a T. Also, reverse transcriptase has a T. That's how you can differentiate or remember that. Non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors bind to allosterocytes, not to active sites. Um, reverse, uh, well, just kidding. Mutations can happen by mutations in the allosteric site, which makes sense because these drugs bind to your allosteric sites. Uh, see. Your protease inhibitors, these inhibit the protease, which um, cleaves inactive protein to form active proteins, including protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase from your genes, specifically gag, pole, and envelope genes. Resistance can be conferred by mutations in HIV protease. Um, let's see. St structures of these drugs... Um, remember, you have a hydroxyl group, and either side of it, either side of it, you have hydrophobic groups. Um, these hydrophobic groups look like either glycine or phenylalanine. What the hydro, what the hydroxyl do, what the hydroxyl does is it hydrogen hydrogen bonds in the protease um, active site to form bonds or to bind to the active site. The hydrophobic green parts bind to protease to form further interactions with the protease for further bonds and also help anchor the hydroxyl into place. Um, the blue parts, the amino, the amino acid looking parts, help the protease enzyme recognize the drug since the protease recognizes specific amino acid sequences, specifically glycine and phenylalanine. So that's why the drug kind of looks like or has parts that looks like glycine and phenylalanine because the protease recognizes these specific sequences to help bind to whatever the virus needs. Finally, your neuronaminase inhibitors. These prevent the formation of N-acetylsialic acid. Say it with me one more time, one last time, just for me. N-acetylsialic acid. They help, it prevents N-acetylsialic acid from splitting from virus, specifically the hemagglutinin part of the virus. And when you split the vi when you split that part, the virus becomes fully mature and released, and it's free to infect the host. So if you inhibit viral neuraminidase through zanamivir and also tamivir, you prevent N-acetylsialic acid from splitting, and you prevent the virus from being fully matured and released to infect the host. That's it for me for this year. P2 year. Thanks for sticking with me through the whole thing. Hope you enjoyed these videos through this year. I'll be back again next year. Don't worry. I won't leave you guys. Um, if you have any feedback, concerns, questions, comments, always feel free to leave it at pollev.com slash c-h-r-i-s-t-i-a-n-r-u-i-629. Feel free to rate it again as... Um, one star, 10 out of 10, would not watch again. Five stars, A plus, would watch again. Feel free to upvote or downvote any other comments or feedback in the poll, just like Yik Yak, if you ever used that back in undergrad. Or if you use that now, I'm not judging. Um, anyways, have a good summer, and good luck with final exams.